Welcome to our first pilot podcast. I'm joined here with Frankie L, Ashley P, Frankie G, and Brian B. And today we'll be talking about women in World War II. To start us off, we'll be having Ashley talking about American women and their role in the armed forces. Ashley, would you like to start for us? Sure thing, Brian. On the Allied front, the U.S. has two main programs of service women that they could enter, enter into in this time of war. The Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, or WAG, and Women's Air Force Service Pilots, also called WAP. All of these women trained as hard as their male counterparts. They flew and broke in planes and trained new recruits, as well as filling in the male-dominated fields that were um, empty due to them fighting abroad. However, these women were not allowed to do missions outside of their bases. The WASP program was made in combining the Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squad and the Women's Flying Training Department. Jacqueline Cochran was one of the most well-known aviators of the time and formed WFPD and went on to serve as director of WASP in its training division, while Nancy Harkness Love of WAFS directed the ferrying division. Cochran pushed for full militarization of WASP, but resisted making WASP a part of WAC because she insisted that the program remains as a women's piloting organization. WAC recruits had to be over the age of 21, and these women couldn't have children of their own under the age of 14, while WASP recruited 18 year olds as long as they had a pilot's license and field experience. WASP was founded in 1943, and in the 16 months that WASP existed, more than 25,000 women applied for training. Only 1,879 candidates were accepted, and of those candidates, 1,074 successfully completed this program at Avengers Field. This is a better washout rate than their male counterparts who had a 50% dropout rate. Now moving on to WAC in World War II, over 150,000 American women served during World War II, and these were the first women other than nurses to serve within the ranks of the U.S. Army. Congresswoman Edith N. Rogers advocated for a bill in 1941 to separate and distinct WAC from the Army Nurse Corps. WAC had women stationed overseas in the European theater, mostly working as telephone switchboard operators, clerks, secretaries, and motor pool drivers. Hmm. Interesting. Now, my one, my one question is, how did the uh, uh, generals feel about women in the military, and how did the... Um, regular soldiers feel about women in the military? So, looking at the generals, Macar- General MacArthur referred to WAC as his best soldiers in that they worked harder, complained less, and were better disciplined than the men. Slander campaigns hurt WAC's reputation and stopped the proposal of women being drafted. It was to the point that these women didn't want to be known as veterans. Hmm. And um, Whereas the general opinion throughout was that within the American press, they favored WAC, usually sympathetic to the adjustments these women made to military lifestyles, as well as the excitement of the job and travel opportunities. However, there were many editorials of, for example, the color of WAC underwear or like their dating lifestyle as well as the over sexualization overall of the members if I remember correctly it also said that um, it would increase uh, homosexuality for women like it would turn them into lesbians if they joined the military if I remember the campaign correctly is that right or wrong it's just one of, it's just one of the misconceptions that were held at the time hmm and do you think um, that would have hurt the um, women's right activists uh, when it came to like uh, integrating women into like actual fighting roles? Of course, it had a major impact overall and without these women during World War II in these positions, we wouldn't be able to have 
women in military now hmm. because there was um, this one woman, they were able to recognize all of the women of Lost and Whack as veterans because there was one specific woman who had been given honorary status and without that documentation, the Air Force wouldn't have been able to um, recognize women going forward as veteran status. Now, luckily for American women, they were able to have some sort of advancement in the military. However, for the German women, they um, didn't have any type of advancement in the military. Uh, Frank, would you care to share some of your thoughts on that? In German combat roles were not nothing any new. So they started out as nurses and auxiliary roles like that in World War One, where they were messengers or they were um, things that just assisted the men. When World War Two came around, they had a more prominent role, but it didn't start off that way. It again started off with them being nurses, and they started off doing things to assist the men. Because Hitler, most prominently, has uh, quoted saying stuff is along the lines of, he didn't want women to be lose their femininity because he felt that that would devalue them and ruin the society because he felt like the morality of society rested on women being these, the, the, um, the mothers and stuff like that and how they were able to be caring and nurturers. So seeing them in combat positions, seeing them in war, he thought would just devalue them and make them seem less than desirable. More masculine. More masculine was not something that he wanted for them. So then the, the Nazi party shared the same idea with that. So what started out was um, originally they were just, again, nurses and auxiliary roles. Then they moved over to communications by around 1941. Because at that point, they just took out France and they're ready to gear for the war for against the Soviets during Operation Barbarossa. So as they wanted every available man to be on the front lines of this war, they wanted to have women be in the communication outposts and more assisting roles like that so every able-bodied man could do it. And the thing about this was they didn't conscript women. All the women auxiliaries in World War II for the Germans, they were volunteers. The Hitler Youth Group, which has become very infamous about you know, these kids who just supported Hitler blindly, they had a women's um, division. It was called the Little Girls of Hitler, or the Little Hitler Women, something along those lines. And with that, they really encouraged women to go and assist the men. That was their role, not to be the heroes of Germany, not to be uh, warriors. It was to just assist the men. And that's how they grew up thinking. So when it came to times of preparing for Barbarossa, they wanted to get every, every available man on there. As Barbarossa was getting halted in, in late 42, early 43, when the Russians were about to push back, they wanted even more men on the front line. So the Air Force became mostly women at that point. The women, they were given, just like with the Americans, broken planes, stuff like that. They weren't trusted with the highest tech. But however, these women, they were able to fight very well. And though most of their history has been suppressed because the Nazis did not want to promote women in, in fighting roles because of that very reason I stated earlier. So as little information that we have of them, we do know that they did fight in the air. They, they did transport. They did fighting. And they actually um, were shooting down fighters, too, from the ground. They worked on the flat guns, and they worked on the anti-air guns. And they were holding the line on the front lines, just as much as the men were. But they were never given any kind of recognition for that. They were just told, you guys are just here to assist the men. Even though they were shooting down Soviet planes and literally fighting, they were told, no, you guys aren't, you guys aren't warriors. You guys aren't making any medals. You're just here to assist the men. Later on, as the war, as the, the war went on, when you know it became even more desperate for the Germans, um, total mobilization has kicked in for the Nazis. And they needed every available a person to defend Berlin, to defend... The Vaterland? The, the, the Vaterland, sure, whatever you want to say it. And they wanted to defend every inch of land they could. So at that point, they were giving women... And any able-bodied adult who was able to fight, they were giving them weapons and sending them off to fight. This was not a glorious sort of battle or anything. It was a desperate last stand. And it was street-for-street street fighting. So women did fight on the, the Germans in World War II. And the Wehrmacht actually had... One in 20 soldiers were actually a woman. And by the end of the war, it turns out that half a million women actually served in the military, whether it be on auxiliary divisions or actually on the front lines using flat guns, piloting, or even in some cases in act active combat. There are, there are photos of women fighting that, again, were trying to be buried, but they resurfaced and we could actually see women fighting on the front lines in the Germany. But it wasn't a glorious battle. It was a desperate act of uh, defense, correct? Exactly that. Yeah, it wasn't a... Um, 
we're going to go in, we're going to kick the door down, and the rest will crumble sort of situation like with the Soviets. It was, okay, the Soviets have met wave after wave of manpower. And if they come to Berlin, they're going to rape you and stuff. I mean, I don't want to comment on that, but I guess that was the, the, the predetermined notion, I guess you could say. They just wanted to fight because, again, this is their homeland, this is yeah. their families. You could even argue that most of the women, the, the, the Hitler Youth Group, yeah, they were blindly Nazis. But, again, with anything in World War II, a lot of things were muddy in some areas, whereas some of the women were only fighting just because this was their home, not because they believed in the ideology of the Nazis, because they just wanted to defend their families, they wanted to defend their homeland. Now they wanted to defend all, everything that they could. Now, did Hitler change his point of view on uh, women in the fighting roles? Like, I know, like, he sort of changed his mind, like, um, when it came to, like, practical uh, usage of them, but did he... But is there, like, any record of him changing his mind, like, personally? Not necessarily. I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I want to say Hitler had a very, very close relationship with his mother. That's how he grew up. So when you see along uh, how his, his views towards women in the, in the fighting, I'm not being some sort of sympathizer with him at all. I'm saying maybe, like, he probably saw women as the mothers and he didn't want to send them off to war. But that quickly changed as the, situ as the war situation escalated. And he was like, okay, I need every able-bodied woman on, to be able to defend because they weren't... He wasn't in inscripting them because of some political, he wanted equ equality. He just wanted every man between, every man and woman between him and the Soviets. And he was going to do everything in his power to make sure, okay. And then when the final, the days were coming to a close, he was like, okay, he needed everything possible. Okay, well, that actually spooks over to uh, Russian women. Um, during uh, Operation Barbarossa, there was actually a lot of women in some frontline roles. Um, the one good thing about the Soviet Union was that they actually embraced uh, egalitarianism, uh, equality between men and women. Um, they allowed them to become like uh, frontline soldiers, snipers, um, tank uh, drivers and all that. There was this actually this one, um, they were actually pilots as well. Uh, there was this one uh, group they called, that the Germans called the Night Witches. And as they were uh, coming into Russia, they were uh, fighting alongside with the men, and they were actually given like significant recognition for it. Like you actually see photos of women getting the title "Hero of the Soviet Union." Again, that was like the highest role for um, for any officer or soldier to get. So, when it came to uh, using women efficiently, um, the Russians actually used them. Uh, really well when it came to actually getting them to fight front in the front lines from the get-go because they actually believed in uh, equality well to an extent I mean uh, they again they were they were communists and there were ulterior motives and it was a dictatorship so sure they might have gotten equality but you had Stalin who just wanted a desperate defense in early 41 to 42 so but as you as they made them as they made their way to uh, Berlin they actually started using uh, less and less women on the front lines like they were actually taking them away from frontline roles and told them to support it was only the Air Force that actually had a significant amount of women in it and even then they were actually given outdated uh, stuff like in like for example, again with the Night Witches, they were given biplanes that were um, interwar period, and while the men pilot, the male pilots were getting like the Il twos and the Yak twos and all that um, advanced technology from um, in the middle of the war, they were still flying airplanes from the 30s. So you can see where the um, uh, where the advantage was, but even if they weren't given that significant advantage, they were able to uh, hold their own and, and there were actually some records that say that they actually uh, did a better job in um, in fighting. It's interesting that we don't hear anything about uh, we barely hear anything about women, don't you agree Frank? Yeah, no, because I think it's mostly the notion that like it was only men fighting and even a few years ago I sort of believed that too, it was just the guys and yeah, just like in everything in history, there's always there's always more there's always yeah. and it's like you gotta take into account that even not even on the front lines, women were still in factories too. They were producing all the guns and all the weapons. So it's not like they were staying at home, you know, playing catch with their kids. They were they were just as active in, in the war. kitchen probably. Okay. Yeah. Um, they were just as active as any other um, man. 
Sure, they may not have the fighting roles, but they were still supporting and they were still contributing to the war effort. Uh, what's your opinion, Ashley? Like, uh, how come we don't hear uh, more women in the um, in the war documentaries? They just don't get the same recognition. They're always viewed as the love interest or other viable roles as seen by Hollywood. Hmm. And they don't get the same appreciation because war is a man's job as seen in so many different aspects of all of these documentaries and they highlight war heroes, which yes, they are heroes and they have done notable deeds and well accomplished and tragic. Hmm. But it's time to recognize all of those who put their lives on the line. Possibly get a few movies about them. No, oh, no, I probably watched a movie on the Night Witches. And like a lot, I mean, you know the Sabaton song, I know that's how you got that info. That was yeah. a good song. Anyway, I guess that's all the time we have for now. Uh, thank you for showing to our first uh, podcast. Again, I'm Brian B. This is Frankie L. We got Frankie G behind the camera. Say hi, Frank. Hi. And we got Ashley P. over here. Uh, tune in next time for another episode. See you next week. Goodbye.